Thank you so much. Yeah. So, welcome to Helsinki back. You have been uh, working for approximately one year as a team coach for Team Finland now. So first, maybe just a few words, because there might be some people who don't know you and your background. So just a quick words about yourself and what do you do back home when you're not training here in Finland? Uh, I have together with my wife and my daughter a small training venue in Apeldoorn in the Netherlands, not so far from the German border. And uh, my wife and I, we bought this place 35 years ago when we, stood, when we sold our first Grand Prix horse. That was the horse I met my wife on, so it was quite a hard decision for us. We did not know what seven horses was because we were just riding and riding and training and riding. I met my wife when she was riding this horse and she had some difficulties with the horse and not together we worked it out. And a few years later, four or five years later, it was an international Grand Prix horse. And my wife and I were in the team. And then there came a dealer with a big, not a, not a mobile phone, those days there were no mobile phones, but a big cigar and a big car. And he said, I want to buy your horse. I said, well, we have thought about that because we didn't know that there was a market in selling horses. So, after a few sleeps, uh, nine weeks of not sleeping well, we thought, well, maybe it's better <coughs> to do something. And by selling that horse, the opportunity came to have some money on the bank. Not that we could buy a place, but some money. So we could go to the bank and our little place became for sale, and then we bought. And ever since we are working there <coughs> together, and since the last 10 years, our daughter is also involved. So we are three partners. We train horses up to from Milan, and we train people from the Netherlands and from abroad. And since a year and a half, it's a year and a half, uh, we also train Finnish people, and which we like a lot. And most, most of the time, I don't like to talk too much about ourselves because that's not important. It's all about riding horses and now Finland, of course. Okay, and also this this session is not meant to be like a lecture. No. no. If you have a question. If you don't understand something, raise your hands. Even you ask the question in Finnish, doesn't matter. We can translate it. Translate it, and your English is very easy for us to understand. So I think no, no worries in that. And uh, we begin by having a few quotes to think about. I always feel sorry that I didn't think of this sentence, so it's not me who thought it out, but I stand behind that for 100%. And it covers a lot of the problems we have these days with welfare of the horse. We're going to talk about it later, and you get a few, a lot more information about that. That's what I heard. But this is really the way it is. The dressage is there for the horse. The horse is not there for the dressage. That means that we can use the dressage to help our horse, to make our horse happier, to let it, I can't say last longer, but to be more healthy, to be more athletic, to be more strong. Dressage is just developing everything that has the horse had by nature. So we make the horse better, we make an athlete of him, and we should always try to have a happy athlete. And when you want an athlete, you want a happy athlete, he has to train, he has to work, but you have to do it in that way, in that level, that the horse can deal with it, physically, mentally, that the horse is ready to get the next step, and the next step has come bit by bit, gradually, on its own, without really realizing that next week I have to do this, or next month I have to do that. It is a training program that you have in your mind, and that you want to feel every day to make a little bit more progress, maybe make a few steps back and do another step forward, and and that's actually all about dressage. All the natural movements that the horse has, we can develop by making them better without changing his natural way of going. That's also the difference in tricks that you saw in the circus. Nothing against that, but it's done in the right way. And dressage. Dressage is developing everything that the horse has by nature. Making him stronger, making him healthy, making him balanced in his mind when he's balanced in his body. When a horse gets balanced in his body by rhythm in the right way, he also gets balanced in his mind. 
so we will get less stress, less tension, and so on and so on. And here's the next mixed uh, sentence. Yeah, I, I, I really think that if we talk about dressage, people are thinking about, first of all, not so happy people, and very serious people that are like that and focused and they're judging the ground in the rain in my head. And, no, dressage is not about a test, dressage is not about a judge, dressage is just all the exercises that are in the dressage tests, and I really think it's very interesting to think about that. Those, all those exercises, if you talk about leg healing, which is the first exercise we do after making a circle, right? Or we talk about shoulder in or half pass or piaf or passage or pirouettes or changes, they are already thought of ages ago, before there has never been any competition at all. They were thought of to train our walls. So it's not a goal to do a dressage, it's something to use the goal that I made my horse better. Everybody can understand if a horse is crooked on one side, now I'm going to give a lecture, that's not good, huh? but okay, if the horse is crooked on one side, that the turn to the right is not doing a good job for him. You can do it to make him happy. But the turn to the right is what he does by himself because he's crooked like that, he likes it that way. So if we train our horse, we also need to realize that what we do must make his body, and then later his mind, better. So the circle left and the shoulder rim left and the half pass left and the travail left are a lot more useful for a horse that's hollow the right than the other one. Because then he keeps on getting unbalanced instead of getting more balanced. If I have to write something down and do it in my right hand, if I break my right arm, then I try with my left hand. But as soon as I can use the right hand, I start writing with my right hand again. With horses, it's exactly the same. They have one side they love to do things on, and the other side is harder for them. If we want to make them good, happy, balanced athletes, we have to try to change those kind of things. So we have to think not five circles left, five circles right, five times left canter, five times right canter. No, some horses one right canter and ten left canter. For that, for that. To make it useful, what we do for them, to improve their whole balance, to improve the way they are built, to improve their conformation and the way they are moving. So you realize that all the exercises, so when you are doing a test, and of course if you go to the competition, don't think when I go to the competition with my rider or with myself or with my daughter, that you don't practice a test, of course. And when you go in the ring, you want to perform as well as you can, and there's nothing wrong with that. When your horse is trained in the right way, you can easily do that. No, actually, you should do that. When you do a competition, you want to be the best. That makes sense. But the training must make it possible that you can become the best. And that means that you have to do on one lead or one exercise a lot more than on the other lead or other exercises. Makes all sense. It all makes sense. There's no magic in this. Yeah. And whenever you have questions in between, at least that's what I think, isn't it? People can ask, right? Yeah. But or if you have an, another opinion, maybe. Because no, this no. is not... No, no, no. This is... <laughs> no, no, no. Of course not. Okay. Because this is talking from an ivory tower. So, explain this. Well, that says everything, right? <laughs> but, yeah, as a, as a team coach, what, what do you need to do what are your uh, goals as a team coach? Of course, we all understand that the team riders, we call that the squad riders, most countries have two squads, an A squad or Olympic squad, whatever you call it, and a B squad that depends on the, the percentages that the, 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 the combination gets in the international competitions. And of course, as a team coach, you are involved, I don't like to always say the word responsible, but that, not that I want to hide myself from those understanding, but you are involved and, and, and in charge of the, the team riders, of course. On the other hand, you need to realize when you are a rider and you're riding X years International Grand Prix, and for whatever reason there comes a new team coach, that you cannot follow that team coach immediately because you've been working your ass off to come into that level. <coughs> 
and you have worked with your horses and you've trained with your private trainer and you've done everything and then there comes a new team coach and then you have to change everything I think that would not be smart so as a team coach for the top riders you have to be careful and talk a lot and get a lot of information from the riders and give them the idea you support them and you want to do whatever they think they need but don't sit immediately on the same place as their private trainer. It can be done if they want it, and if they feel the need of it, and if you think it can help. Of course, you can show them the way where you want to go to. I personally always follow the line that if I think that riders could do better than they do, and you hear that I always talk about the rider, not, not so much about the horse, because I think it's Thank God, it's still the rider, it's always the rider that must make the horse better, right? And then I always try to, to give them the idea, to show them examples of other riders that are, to my opinion, doing a better job in that particular aspect. aspect. So I'm not an as complete rider. That's for me always the best way to show them that you don't tell them, don't do this, do it that way. Because then they think, well, I've been up to Grand Prix and now I get almost 70%. Why should I listen to you? Because I hardly know you. So I think it's really important communication is especially in the top of that triangle, I call that, very, very important. That the riders feel first comfortable with you, that they trust you, that they communicate with you. And with one rider, it's easier to communicate with the other. We all know that. They're all different people. And that they have the feeling you're behind them, you support them as much as you can, and if the need is there, of course you'll be there as a kind of private trainer. And for one rider, they want it more than another one, okay, they you fill it in. And we have an agreement with all the riders that I stay in touch with, them, with the top riders, I mean, the, 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 the team riders, if I can call it the team riders, because this year we probably don't have a team, as you know. And that, but to stay in touch with them, and to let them contact me whenever they want me to come over to train with them or to look at them or look at the horses and then one calls you every week and now then you have to go after three or seven hours and things go, yeah it's going well, okay, yeah, next competition, yeah, maybe next month and then a week later you see there's been on a competition so, that this, that, so with one person you have more connection than with the other one which does not mean that the one is better or not as nice as the other one you have to respect that everybody, because the Grand Prix with your horse is an individual sport you're doing at that moment. At that moment it's an individual sport. You have to respect that as a trainer, as a team coach. If you support them, if you have a good atmosphere with all the rides, of course the individual scores will get higher than when there's a bad atmosphere. We all understand that. That's what you need as a team. You need a good backup for one another, you need to support one another, and then, you, then the individual results will get a lot better. So that's actually what, what I think that the team coach needs to do most, depending for a great deal on how the rider itself, the rider itself feels what he or she needs and what he or she wants. And if it turns out after a while that if you let them do their own thing, that there's not enough progress, or they don't make the scores that you think they can get. Well, then it's time for another talk, you say, and then you should never, at least that's not the way I do it, you should never tell them, come over here, because you have to respect them, because don't forget that everybody, and now especially these days, in these days, when we see the Finnish riders who are in the team, I respect that a lot, that you leave your country, you leave your family, you leave everything behind, you go to abroad, you go abroad, to, to set up your stable there, and to, to, do, to do, do your work. And that's not, there's in life more than just riding horses. And so it's a big, big, big step when you can do that. So I respect that a lot, but that doesn't mean that I agree with everything they do. And I will talk with them about it and say, okay, how to make more progress, or do you want me to talk to your private trainer? Because at the moment, it's a very good situation with all the riders that are abroad, that none of them is training with a rider, that, with a trainer that I have my doubts about, so that makes it a lot easier. And whenever there could be a situation that one of the good riders would train with a, with a trainer, with a private trainer that I would not like so much, I don't mean personal, but the way he trains. Thank God that's not the case in this situation. So that's about the top riders. I have, next to that, I have the feeling that everything that's 
into dressage is in a way under my umbrella, if I can say it. So I feel connected and involved, and I don't want to say responsible because that's of course not possible, but I feel like a kind of responsibility that let's talk about, for example, the trainers of just instructors in the riding schools. I think it is, of course I don't know them, I've hardly I've seen them, but I think it is very important that also in the instructors in the normal riding schools, the basic ideas about riding and about training should have the same basic fundamental principles like I have. And I can tell you, that feels good. It gives me a good feeling. So if I'm over here and I see what people do, the, the, the trainers who train the youth riders, I have a very good impression about that, a good feeling. I can cooperate with them really well. It gives me a good feeling. Uh, and further, so not only the instructors and the trainers, but also the, what I told you about the trainers of the youth riders. And we even go that far that, that every time I come over, the trainers of the youth, I don't know if you call them youth riders, I think so, is that correct? So the, the, the children and the ponies and the, I call them youth riders. So the trainers of the youth riders, most of the time they, tra they ride with me, they train with me when I'm here, and I guide them as much as I can. And approximately, I'll try to come over every three to four weeks to fit it. Which is not always easy, because as you understand, the top riders who are in Denmark or England or Luxembourg or Germany, yeah, I also have to visit them, so that's quite some traveling, as you understand, but I don't complain, I just mention it to you, to let you understand it's easy to say we go there after a few weeks, but it's not always in practice, not always easy to do it. Yeah, and, and I also have the idea with, uh, with the, the, the top riders again, because that's something I, I wanted to, want you to know. The, the top riders that we have from Finland, at the moment, most of them are based overseas. And I think one of my biggest goals is that we also get more and more top riders riding for Finland who are based in Finland. So that's for, for that reason, I made the step that I try to come over as often as I can, what I said, about every three or four weeks, approximately, and to try to get a base here over, over here in which we have the same scores at the same level as we have seen from the, from the riders who are overseas. So that there be a competition that the ones who are in Finland are trying to work up themselves at the same level. And I think, I really think it is possible. As I told you in the start, when, when, when we were in the Dutch team, it was in the 80s. And believe me, you can say I was in the team and you went to World Championships and the Festival Olympic Games, blah, 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 blah. But Dressage and Manners wasn't anything. It wasn't that high. Absolutely not. So I can say I was there, but the level wasn't high. It was really very average, very average. The Germans, first of all, were the Russians good, but it was before I was in the shows. I've never seen them really competing when they were winning. As soon as I came, in the international scene, the Germans were winning everything with the Swiss riders, with Christian Zuckerberg and, and Uri Lehmann and all this other, okay, that's history. And the French were quite good, by the way, but okay, that doesn't really matter. So we were, as Dutch riders, we were not so good. And if you see how that developed in, let's say, 10 to 15 years, that's amazing, because 10, 15 years, I don't exactly know, but let's say 10, 15 years later, the Dutch were top of the world. And they were really high-class dressage riders and, 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 and breeders and trainers and everything was there. And if you look at the USA, I know that I've been a lot in America in the last couple of years, not anymore because I was a Dutch team coach and I'm a Finnish team coach, so you can spread up yourself. So I have I have a lot of connections in the USA, but not going there a lot anymore. My wife visits there once in a while to do a clinic and to stay in touch with the students and the clients we have. But I personally don't go there so much anymore, but I still stay in touch with them. But I remember that some time ago, I told people, listen, we have to take care about the Americans because they're going to beat us. <laughs> Come on, they're going to beat us. Only rich people who buy expensive horses cannot ride. 
I said, pay attention, it's not true. Because I saw the training over there. I saw what they did in Florida, how they got together, how they were training, how serious they were with the riding. And I must agree, they bought good horses. That's also true. That's part of it. Huh? But, and now if you see where they are now, and the best, the best example for me is still always how the British have done it. And then I really, I never will mention name, but this guy I want to name, if you see what Carl Hester did in that job, that's amazing. That one person was training so well and teaching so well, and that he, for to my, that's my personal opinion, right? That he brought up the dress art in England in a way that I think is un un unbelievable. And there was only, in, in England they could hunt, and they could uh, do, how do you call it, three-day eventing, and they could jump. The dressage that was, not, was for old ladies. Well, that was not interesting for them. And if you see, now they're absolutely top of the world, in a fantastic way, with good, normal good horses, not with the top horses that they bought in the auctions for two million or whatever. They buy good horses, of course, you cannot do it on a bad horse, we understand that, but the, the what makes them so special, is that they have a basic principle of training, which I agree with for, let's say, for 100%, if that is possible, and they just make the best of every horse and every rider, and to my opinion, but that's a personal thing, I really think that's for a big deal, the, uh, the, the job of Carl Hester. He did such a great job as a trainer, as a rider, and he still does. And so we can still see that it is possible, that gives me always the spirit, that if we say, well, if we come over to Finland, and we do it every couple of weeks, and we keep our trainers for the youth, we keep them motivated, and we keep them stimulated the way they are, and working in the right way, we will get our goals. We will get our goals. I can only not promise if it's next year, or two years later, or in Paris already, which of course we all hope. But the scores of the top riders, is very often not the right picture of the whole dressage on long term. If you do a good job on the long term, then you will stay there where you are, you will stay steady, and you will always have bad luck, and you have good days and bad days, the good moments and get bad moments, but still, you will always get your scores, you will get your results the way it is, and you have, um, you have a way of doing the sport in a way that everybody loves it, because it's lovely to ride a horse in a wonderful way, it's lovely to look at. Is that about what we want just to just uh, thought about uh, because you were mentioning the top riders now the squad riders 18 riders now we have one individual place for Tokyo let's talk about briefly about the way and your eyes on Tokyo but how is how it's going to be so we have one place but of course everybody knows that like in any sport like javelin throw or or wrestling so the place is not earmarked to a person to a certain person right. Yeah, uh, as we all know, that uh, Henry Roster uh, deserved, how do you call it? Made the place, reserved the place. He, uh, you, you know what I mean? You, but that doesn't mean that he is going. That the, the best combination will go. Who decides that? Probably I can give an advice. The Federation gives advice to the Olympic Fund. And then the Olympic Fund says, okay, that combination will go. So we have one rider going, one rider going to the Olympics. And uh, when I started, uh, here, uh, as, as, the, as the team coach, I said, well, let's forget about Tokyo. And I didn't mean that I didn't want to go or we had no other. It was not realistic to, to think you could make a good team result for Tokyo. That was not realistic. And we all hoped, and every rider worked as hard as they can, and so did I. And they did the best that they can. We were not so lucky with some people, one or two horses, but that's also part of the deal for every, every team that's the same. And so we were not really lucky, that is true. But no excuses, I hate excuses. And for the Olympics this year, I think that one individual rider will do the best he or she can. And we have to wait and see after time which one will be the best. And then we go. I just want to tell you something else. How, before I forget if I can, because this weekend, three of the team ride, top riders, I, I don't want to call it, we call it squad riders. You don't mind squad riders that are in, in, the, in the picture to be in the team, right? Three of them are riding an international show this weekend. This weekend, one in France, Henri, one in Norwegian, Emma, and one in Norway, Stella. So we are working, they are working, and it's, it's, it's coming up. But we have to continue. We are maybe on the right way, but slowly continuing what we're doing and make the best of what we can. And talk about 
the future talents a little bit later, but uh, uh, any other surprise countries, by the way, looking at Tokyo, you mentioned, oh, of course, Germany, USA, Netherlands, Sweden, UK, any surprises coming? You see, or are these the strongest nations for the team, team event in Tokyo? Do you think that, are there any upcoming, like, surprise countries, or do you think that the, the old ones, so I, to speak? I, I don't think it's that far yet that any surprise will come. If I see the riding in Germany, that is so thoroughly and so well in their basic training, and that will bring up the next Grand Prix team again. The British, the same. Americans could be not having the best year this year. That might be possible. So the Americans, it's not for sure. The, the, the Danish, I think they might be very good. They might come up really well. They, they could actually have one more top combination. That's, that's what I think. And the Dutch, no, we have to wait and see. It's a little bit going up and down with the, with the, the way they ride for this, for this time of year. I think in the near future, they might have a few horses that can really perform well. But I think, to my opinion, if I can say so, that I think the Germans and the British are really top of the bill. The, the bronze, that might, be, that might be a discussion that we don't really know. Depending on the form of the day, depending on how the horses will last, and so on, and the riders will last. Okay, so the next, next topic is also one of the discussions that we're going to have on the panel discussion a little bit later. And it's, it's the vital and, and more really important one, it's the welfare of the horse. And there's another quote which you can uh, dig, dig into and start discussing about this a little bit later. Yeah, I hear a lot that people say, now these days the welfare of the horse is very important. I think that's rubbish. Everybody that starts doing our job, started that for our hobby because they love horses, because they love horses. So when you are riding, the welfare of the horse is always the biggest part of why you are doing it. And I, also, I of course, I also know that sometimes it's forgotten when the pressure is there for winning a class or... But the welfare of the horse is, to my opinion, very well, very much related to correct training. If you train and if you ride your horse in the right way, it's hardly ever happening that you get problems with stewards or with press or with photographers or because it is everybody can see if you want to train your horse into a happy athlete, then you have to train him. And if you do it in the right way, he will absolutely not hate it. Absolutely not. And don't think that I've never made those those mistakes. Of course, we all do. Learn from it. And don't be frustrated about things that don't go right. And I'm 100 percent convinced, but I know that you're gonna talk later about welfare because otherwise I won't stop talking about it. But for me that is not now these days the most important thing, it's always been the most important thing. Because that's why we started our sport, and, and I'm convinced that our sport horses, our top horses, don't have a bad life. They have a good life. They have a good life. They're taken care of, and then you can discuss, is it because they are worth a lot of money? Personally, I think it's because the people who take care of them really love the animal. That's my first thing. And of course, when they are worth a lot of money, there are other interests coming as well. But the most important thing is that we all care about them. Everybody who has horses has dogs. Yeah, and everybody who has horses and loves all the animals in, in the farm they have. And that's all the farm and the, 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 the place they have. So I think that it's very important that we inform the people in the right way who are blaming us for the sport, who are blaming us about what we are doing, to tell them that, listen, people who are doing work with horses, it's not their sport, it's their way of life. And they start in the morning early and they go back at late night because why well, they want to check if the horses are fine. And they don't do that because they want to win the prize tomorrow. Of course not. Because when there's no competition, they also do it. And we also make our rounds in the morning and our rounds in the evening before we go to bed to see if everything is okay. And not because I think he's worth a lot of money. It's that why do we all have our horses that are 60, 70, 80 or 90 years old? We still keep them. And it's not bringing them away because we love them. We still love the animals. We care about them. It's our way of living. But I think you have enough for that, otherwise I hope there's nothing left to say this afternoon for the other people. 
Yeah, you will, you will cover the panel discussion by yourself. And if you have a unanimous decision about that discussion, then if you're talking about just by yourself. But the most, what is important for the, any, any sport or is finding the talents. And of course, when you're talking about talents, we should divide the talents on how do you find you said talk about earlier about we have a really good ponies juniors youth trainers here in Finland. So and also how do you how do you look for of course they are presented to you but what do you look in talents if you will divide this a little bit for the riders, for the horses and for the trainers for you to assist. How do you how do you see this? Yeah that is that is a very interesting and, and, and important part of what we're doing. First, we can talk about what is a talent. We, we, we all know that, that the, the boy or girl who sits one night straight and looks at the man and says, looks how he sits on the horse, that's a talented rider. But I think it's more than just the picture. It's more, it's more the mind. Does that person really want it? Does that person really care about the horse he's riding or the pony he's riding? Does he really care about making progress in the right way? Does he really care about training the horse and the pony? And that is our job, the youth trainers and my job, to make them realize why we do that riding, what we try to get when we, try, when we ride our horses, what we try to, to achieve with them. And so that's, that's our job. But So the talent is, in my opinion, more than just looking at a film, looking at a clip, because maybe you can understand that quite often I get sent a clip by a parent or, or, or or, or, or the, the husband of, uh, of, 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 of a wife, they say, look at this, and my wife is very tense, wants, can, you, can you start teaching her? And then they send you a clip, and then they say, I cannot see if she's talented, or if he is talented, and I cannot see that. Because the only thing I can see, he is correct or not correct on the horse, and he's in the movement, he's riding in the right way, but I don't know if the spirit is really there. And because if you want to do this, it has to be your way of life. That's what I told you. If you want to do it in the sport, you want to do it in question sport, it must be your way of life. And I cannot see that in two months if somebody wants to do that. I cannot even see it in two years. But that takes time. So that's for talent scouting, that makes it harder. It's not only the way how they kick the ball or how they do that. It's, it's, only, it's also the way of life. Probably with those other sports, it might be the same thing. Huh? That you also have to live for it. But okay, we're not in those other sports. So that's one thing. The other thing, if you organize, what we did in the Netherlands a lot, I was part of that, 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 uh, that, that squad also who, to, who was looking for the talented riders. And then you could always see that they were riding in their own discipline, and they were riding in their own discipline. And I think that too early we start these days with selecting children in riding only dressage, or only jumping, or only this, or only that. I think you just have to be a basic rider as a rider, jump on your pony without the saddle and ride around, bring it to the field, and that would be great if it's still possible. I don't know if it's not possible everywhere, but where it's possible, it would be great for those kids. And when they are involved with the sport, with the animal, more than being just involved in the dressage or jumping, for me it's and of course a dressage sport, but we really feel involved with the animal and how to take care of it, and how to train it, and how to make it better, that's for me a big deal in being a talent. And because those, those kids, those, those children, will also work later as hard as they can to improve their own way of riding so they can improve their horse or their pony. Because training is going to make your horse or your pony better, it's improvement. And if they really go for it, not only sit on the, on the animal half an hour because now I've done the test and now it's again for next week and do it again. No, that's a talent, what I think. So it was really hard for us for me, being part of that talent scouting, to decide if one or two particular children were talented to come into that talent scout. What do you do then? Of course, you end up with having the best position of the children and having the best horses or ponies, and they are selected. But it could be really possible that one who is not having a good horse or a good pony, as a rider, has a better mind and a better motivation and a better body to ride. So that's always hard to find out. And I'm sure that the ones who are really talented, at the end, they make it. 
So for me, not a guarantee that all the, the, the top riders have to come from being a good pony rider, be a good junior, be a good young rider, be a good U25 rider. I know many examples of international top riders who never gone through that path because when they were younger, they simply did not have the possibility to come into that circuit, to come in that world. And they made their own way. And there are other examples of people who start really well with the ponies in junior and young rides, and they also come into the top. So every possibility is there. But what I would like to see that we as trainers and we as responsible people try to find also and to support also those children who just have a very normal horse or pony, but they are willing to work, they are interested in what we should do with the horse, and they have talent to become a good rider. I think that would be a very, very good thing to realize that we don't only look at the ones who win, who win the class now with the pony or with the, with the horse. And I don't say you skip them, you only can take them. You have to do both of them, both sides. And do we talk about the, the breeding or not yet? Yeah. Because for me, it would be a very good idea to find a link but that's a little bit a dream, that's, I must say that. That's a little bit something I've tried in the Netherlands, but it did not really... Maybe we also didn't have enough time, that's possible. Right? That it took a little bit longer. But what I think is really important, that we try to get a link between the riders and the breeders. I think there are a lot of breeders who, who breed good horses, and they have not the possibility of training the horse, or having a train, because that's expensive. Or so or they need the room because next year comes again one or two falls or three. And so then they sell them for more money. And three, four years later the horse is sold for the good ones are sold for a fortune. And the breeder is still a little bit proud, but on the other thing, and he thinks, yeah, now I got five thousand euros for that horse, now it's sold for how much? I don't know. So there must be a possibility to get a link in between those two parties because there are riders who would like to have a good horse. There are breeders who want to breed good horses who want to take care of that situation. But okay, that's what I said. That's, to my opinion, a little bit of a dream. And normally I don't dream so much, but it's a little bit something that I think I cannot really say we have to do this and then, then we get it fixed. But if we don't think about it, we never get there. I think this is a general problem in the Netherlands, in, the, in Germany, in Sweden, Finland that the breeders and the riders don't actually meet because of course the breeders need the money because they have to pay X amount of euros for hay and this and this and that. Everybody who breeds horses know this. And in Finland it's particularly expensive for obvious reasons. But by the way, talking about the talents and, and you said about the riders that you, you wish to see that their attitude in general is also in a correct way that you don't just have the good pony and uh, ride well and get good marks. Do you? How much time do you spend in interviewing these young talents that you you are presented with, or do you do you like, like to spend the time with listening a little bit about how their mindset is? I I personally don't spend time in that at the moment. I don't. Unfortunately, I cannot do that. You know, we have, we have our own stable. We have we have Finland. We have that's that's fully booked. So we. But I really think there must be a possibility that whenever one of the youth trainers sees a good rider that does not have the best horse but will become a good rider, that we pick them out and say, okay, there must be a fund or something that we can still train because those good, talented riders also need good training. And because when you're talented, that doesn't mean that you will be there. You just have to learn how to ride. And when you're talented, maybe you learn a little bit quicker than the other one. But you still need to be taught what to do in what moment and for how long. So I think that the, the good thing was would be, and that's what I didn't get worked in the Netherlands, to be honest, because there were only talented combinations in that those talent squads that already had a good horse and already were performing in the way say, yeah, we need that one, that's a good one. Yeah, of course, you can see that's a good one. Everybody can see that. Just look at then you don't have to look at the combination, just look at the results of the scores. If you look at the results, everybody who's winning, of course you can say that that will be a talented boy or girl because she's only 40 years old and you are already class with 70 percent. Then you don't need a scout to see that. But the scout needs to be working on I see a talented rider who it looks like if he's willing to work for it, then we 
anything to support that in a kind of way that he still gets good lessons because then later on the voices will also come. There was a question. Yeah. Uh, when I kept my last train lesson, so I lost my watch. Uh, anyway, um, I'm Katri Vara, I live in Sweden, for Finnish the Freedia uh, And I would like to ask you that uh, a way to find the talented writers uh, would be a way to introduce the English style of pleasure writing competitions for young writers in writing schools, where you judge just only the writer and they ride the horse relaxed. I think that might help, but personally, I'm a step higher in scouting the talented writers, if you understand what I mean. So I don't mean international, but my, my, my personal idea about seeing if somebody is a talented writer must not be when he's doing writing school writing every week, once or maybe once every two weeks, because that is just the, 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 the time that you can see he has to still go out there, make his uh, experience and get used to the fact that he wants to ride, get used to the fact that he wants to, to do the job. And then that's, I really mean a level high. So I really mean that that's somebody that I don't say that's not, not a good idea. Of course it's a good idea. But not when the youth trend should say, okay, that's a good uh, rider, that, that boy is going to be a good rider. He's now uh, 30 years old, 12 years old. He's doing a riding school every week. He rides a lesson on his pony or on a horse. I think that's that's not doable. That's not practical. That's not doable. But of course, the English system of, of training the horses and uh, training the riders, judging the riders, that's what you do. That's what you mean. That you don't look at the horse, just look how he sits on the horse. And we call it in the Netherlands a sit competition. Great. And that they have a competition. They just look at how the rider sits. If, they see, if the body is following the movement in the right way, if the position is correct, which are the basic things we should never forget. And that's the basic thing we should never forget, to sit in a proper way on the horse and learn to follow the movement of the horse. And, okay, I think that's important, but my talent scouting is the level high, if I, which is nothing against what you said. Any other questions? Because we have now good time for, for some discussion also. If you have opinions or, or questions, he's here to hear for you. How much time do you, by the way, you spend uh, with the youth and the ponies trainers. So do they also always, when you're in Finland, coaching the, whoever is in your in your uh, training at that time, but do they always come and come and chat with you, and uh, you will have some sort of update about about the names and, and the riders and how they're doing? Yes, uh, maybe good to mention that again. Top of the list are the squad riders. We take care of the squad riders. They ride Grand Prix, they, pre they represent the country. That's what I'm team coach for. My job as a team coach is coaching training. And you understand with them? One more training, one top rider, one more trainer, but that depends on what the rider wants itself. Top of the list, team, team top riders, top riders. Huh? Directly followed by all the other Grand Prix riders that we have in Finland. That we have the ones who are doing the good St. George I want test that we say because we fill that we fill the days. And I'm coming over and fill 12 riders a day. So and then so top riders and the top Grand Prix riders from Finland and then the top younger riders. We have a few young riders that are quite talented, good, quite good horses and quite talented, with a lot of fun to work with them. And then I must say that I can really feel that they are educated in the same way as I edu try to educate my, 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 my riders, my younger riders. So that, that's really a pleasure to do that because there's not, you don't have to tell them, don't do this, don't do that. You can just tell them, go on with that, or change that, or go change that a little bit. They do a good job. I really like that. And then, yeah, then everybody who comes in and has a higher level, then another one falls out. That's the way it is. I, can, I cannot train more than, let's say, 12 or 13 a day. And so that's, but most of the time we still, every time we have a slot, we fill up somebody. If he's good or not, not, not good enough yet, we fill it up. I fill my day with training everybody. 
But starting from the top when I'm here, and then we do it that way. Yeah. There was also a question that uh, because the Dutch, as you said before, they have gone from being the, like in the weakest countries in the world, being now in the top countries of the world. Have you brought already into the Finnish system something that might have been done previously in the Netherlands or in the UK that now you have applied to the Finnish system that we might see uh, some changes? I don't mean to, uh, to this uh, or to say that about the previous trainers we have had over the years, but but have you changed anything dramatically or have you just slowly? I, I have not not I haven't changed any, anything dramatically. Absolutely not. I didn't, I didn't feel the need at all. What I think what we need to do, go do, go do a good job and make progress step by step. Every day when you do it, every time when you when you meet somebody or when they do their homework, when they're by themselves, just do your proper work. Train your horse in the right way. Do the best thing you can with your horse. And then I must say there's another not a lot of things that I really have to change from this way to that way. Not a lot. A few things. Now we have to keep in our mind that the horses really, the horses should be open in the frame. The horses should not have a short frame because thank God the judges don't want to see it. Thank God. But it's also the way the horse can function in his body. So if you want to have the athlete, you cannot be happy that you bring the tie together because then your back gets stuck. And when your back gets stuck, you cannot never use a high flex the way you want it. I mean, as a horse. And so that's with some some rides and some trainers, you have to train, train you have to, to, to keep that in your mind, keep the horse open enough into the rider instead of holding it back with your hand. But that's the normal job that we have, because that happens. We as human beings correct everything with our hand. We all say hi, we never say hi. Yeah? We do everything with our hands. So we also try to ride with our hands, but you should ride from back to front into the hand. Nice, your time. Okay. I think, good question, good job here, the question, how we could interfere the national instructors, the local instructors in our training. We had one meeting already in, uh, what was it, the Helsinki show, I think, and then we had already had a meeting and we agreed with the federation that through the training, the national, the, the coaches are always welcome to come, and they're always welcome to ask things and discuss things with me. So we, that's one of the things I meant in the beginning of my talk, that I think as a team coach, it's no use to only focus on this team. That's why the part below is so important. And that is, I can give you an example, and I'll still mention names because I can do it, because Klaus Baum was a friend of mine, the German guy, so I can talk about him. He was the American team coach. He did a fantastic job. They won the first American medal, only compliments for him. There was no time for him to spend time to the lower part of that triangle. What happened when he stopped? They fell down. When, what happened when the team was over and the horses were, 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 were not in the right shape, were not coming, they were not coming back horses. So then they fell down because I think it's really important that you start at the bottom and really make it happen and then try to build them that way. Yeah? So the instructors are always welcome when I come over here. That's also part of the open doors, but it's nothing, nothing is hidden. Like it's not, it's not like, okay, you need a secret password to get in. No, not with riding and not with training. No, not at all. No. No. And tomorrow he's in, you are in Dubai. Yeah, this afternoon. And this afternoon, yeah. So. And tomorrow. Yeah. And the next week. <laughs> well, anyways, you get to know, know the city of Ubaya quite well, the metropolis, <laughs> so to speak. I want to say one more thing, is it possible? I, I, I see top riders as artists, like good painters. <coughs> and that's, for me, the people who know me can probably agree with that, I'm a doing person. I want to be involved. I want to do something and work with them. That's, that's the way I am. Good or bad, that's the way I am. So, what I really need to learn, 10 years ago, approximately, maybe 15, is that when I saw a good rider, and he made one wrong line, 
in this writing on wrong principle, if I can say that, it can still be a good writing. It can still perform good or quite good. And then I thought, and then I tried to change it, and I talked with him, he said, oh, this is that, this is that, and the result got done. Shit, I was a person, because I was, I'm sure I was right. What I said, I looked it back on the videos, and for sure I was right, but the result was going down here. And later on I thought by myself, see it this way, that rider has in his system with that particular horse, most of the time it comes back with the other horses as well, to be honest, but okay, he has one negative thing, one thing which is not so good. Then I saw it this way, if you take the painter Rembrandt, long ago he died, nobody can deny that he was a good painter. And if you take Picasso, your style, maybe not your style, a good painter, completely different style. How would the painting look when Picasso ended his painting almost for, let's say, three quarters of the painting, and he said, Rembrandt, your such a painter, you can make the last quarter of that painting. The painting look awful, would look awful. And nobody can deny that Rembrandt was a good painter, and Picasso was, well, he died, right? was a good painter. So I really think as a trainer, as a coach, that's more training, more coaching and training thing. You have to be aware that if a person does with that particular horse a good job, he misses something, you have to be really careful by changing it. Because bit by bit the chance is bigger that when they change that particular thing, even though you might be right, that the total result goes a little bit down. That's the interesting part of being a coach. Personally, I always like training, because you work, you ride, you feel it, and the feeling on the horse is your motivation, at least that's my motivation every day, when I feel on the horse, right? And as a coach, you have to be a little bit more careful, because sometimes, even though you could be right, it does not only always help immediately. Later on, most of the time, it gets in your advantage that it works better and better. That's all. Thank you.